again, I'm Heather Grady, Vice President for Foundation Initiatives at the Rockefeller Foundation. And on behalf of all of my colleagues at the Rockefeller Foundation, let me welcome you to day two of this event. We have a smaller group today, what I like to call the hardcores, those of us that really want to roll up our sleeves and problem solve the challenges that we began to identify yesterday and seize on the opportunities that we discussed. I think we'll come up with a few new ones today. I'm not going to summarize yesterday because my colleague uh, Mamadou Bate did that very well yesterday afternoon. But I do want to say that the two goals of the Rockefeller Foundation, promoting more equitable growth and building resilience to both acute shocks and chronic stresses, are quite relevant to the theme of agriculture that we're featuring at this event. As was pointed out yesterday again and again, when we see agriculture not just as a factor in poverty reduction, but as an engine for growth, when we create agricultural programs that are inclusive for women, for youth, for all farmers, and when we identify innovations in agriculture that tackle old problems and new ones, like climate change, we will be living a transformation agenda for Africa. I'd now just like to introduce my colleague, C.D. Glynn. I think many of you know that we have a regional office here in Africa in Nairobi. Uh, C.D. is our associate director there uh, within our program team, and he will be running through the agenda for today. C.D. Good morning, everyone. What a great day we had yesterday. So under normal circumstances, when you're putting together a, this happens often, but a 100th year birthday celebration, a summit to talk about realizing the potential of African agriculture, if the sitting head of state comes, he brings along the prime minister of a neighboring country and you invite some of your closest friends who happen to be ministers of ag, ministers of finance from throughout the continent. That's success. You pat yourself on the back. You say, what a great event. Mission accomplished. But for us, all of those of us in this room, that was the warm-up act. Yesterday, we tilled the soil. We planted some hybrid, drought-resistant, drought-tolerant, high-yielding seeds that hopefully will bring some food for thought for today. But today, today is about the harvest. It's about harvesting. It's about processing what took place yesterday. We want to take all of that to the market. We want to scale it. We really want to talk about overcoming some of the constraints to taking these islands of excellence, these catalytic innovations that we heard about from all of our speakers yesterday to scale, developing strategies for unlocking the barriers. Because as His Excellency President Jonathan said, we can't eat potential. Africa's agricultural development can't prosper on potential. It needs to be realized. And that's why here today, we'll have a panel discussion led by our Vice President for Foundation Initiatives, Heather Grady, that will tackle and reflect on some of yesterday's discussions. We'll hear from our colleagues at Oxfam, who will enlighten us on their perspective on scaling catalytic innovations, and more specifically, the process in some, on, on, that they used in the research and scanning of these catalytic innovations that are occurring throughout the continent. Our perspective is that there are positive things, proven things that are happening, and one of the challenges is really sharing more of them, but also looking at unlocking the barriers and the constraints to scaling them. So we'll hear from our colleagues at, at, at Oxfam on that. And let me go a little bit into some of the initiatives. All of you in your packets, you saw these eight, eight case studies. These case studies 
are illustrative of many of the things that are, that are happening. There was a, a real um, process that unearthed them, but they're illustrative. And we really, at the Rockefeller Foundation, will use these initiatives, discussions here, to really inform our future thinking and, and our broader strategy. But more importantly, we want to turn these innovations into high-yielding innovations to really scale them. And that will be done through a very deliberate dissemination process at other events that, that would occur throughout the year. But really, we want to put this information in the public domain so that the story isn't about what's not happening. The story is about what's happening and how can we do more of it? How can we, again, take it to scale? And then we're going to get into some more specific recommendations that will really come from you. We're going to break into groups. We're going to break into groups to really dig into the ideas for overcoming some of these constraints. So between the panel discussions, Oxfam's um, information sharing, your own, your own breakout groups, that will sort of um, be the harvesting, the processing, and really the scaling of what took place yesterday. I'll be back um, shortly to share more about the process for uh, breaking out into groups and, and, and some instruction on that. But for now, let me bring back uh, to the stage Heather Grady, who will introduce her panel. Thank you, and I look forward to a great day today. Thank you for joining us today and being on this uh, panel that's going to warm us up. This is really a segue from what we talked about yesterday to what we're talking about today. So let me introduce just very briefly, we have directly to my left, Mr. Dr. Weba Bohr, who is the CEO of the Tony Elemelu Foundation. And I might mention that Weba uh, was raised here in Nigeria and has just offered to translate into Hausa if any of us need that. Uh, to his left is Gary Tennyson, again, Dr. Gary Tennyson, who's the managing director at the Rockefeller Foundation in charge of agriculture and has led a lot of our efforts over the year for the Green Revolution. He is actually our longest serving program officer. We're very proud of his work. To his left is Mr. Arnie Cartridge, director of Grow Africa. And Arne, I know you're going to tell us more about your work. And to his left is Roy Harold Roy McCauley, Executive Director of the West and Central African Council for Agricultural Research and Development. So we have four very distinguished panelists. And what I'm going to do is first throw out some of the questions that came up from the tables yesterday, and then ask each of them to address the questions if they can, and also to share just a couple of top line observations from yesterday based on the work that they have done. So first, in terms of the questions, uh, several questions were posed around the whole question of financing and access to capital. I'll just give some examples. How do smallholder farmers access funding without collateral? How can we fund the women farmers effectively to really reach the grassroots? What are the main issues with unlocking capital for smallholder farmers, especially when we want them to grow into small and medium enterprises? The missing middle. How do we best give youth and women access to land and product processing credit facilities? And what can we do to reach farmers in remote areas with improved processing and other value-added services, both by philanthropy and governments? There was also questions around um, how to get knowledge and information about agricultural production to youth to create jobs. And finally, a very provocative question, 10 years after Maputo, how do we hold governments accountable to their commitments? 
Okay, with no further ado, Weba, I think I'll hand over to you first. All right, thank you for putting me on the spot. Um, she, also, she didn't mention I'm also a former Rockefeller staff. Um, and uh, as the Honorable Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria said yesterday, uh, you know, he, uh, Gary was also my mentor at Rockefeller Foundation. And I think almost anybody who has anything to do with agriculture in Africa at some point has been touched by Gary. Um, so it's a bit intimidating to be here. Um, we should really let him speak first. But um, I'll, I'll look at the first question, actually, specifically the, the financing one. Um, our foundation is founded by an ex-banker, um, and, uh, and so we, we do look at all our transactions quite, quite rigorously, and it is actually very, very difficult to fund anything that involves smallholder farmers. Um, and so it, it is really one of the big questions that we need to figure out. Um, Kola Masha back there has sort of started to solve the problem with farmers up in Kaduna. Um, so I think if his, if his model works, we'll all have something to follow. Um, but there's a lot of efforts going on. I think the Nigerian effort uh, called NIRSAL, which was mentioned yesterday, is probably one of the best ones, which is really trying to get banks to unlock their lending because we really, uh, you know, setting up sort of separate institutions or small funds and so on doesn't really unlock the amount of capital that's really needed and they don't then have the sort of uh, leverage and footprint on the ground to really get to all the farmers. But even NIRSAL has been very, very difficult to execute on because the typical commercial bank in Nigeria and other parts of Africa don't really um, go down to that level, um, and, and, uh, it, which, which increases the difficulty. So one example that we worked on actually was, um, thankfully our founder you know, founded a bank and now is a, has a controlling interest in it, so we have a lot of influence with this bank, um, UBA, United Bank for Africa. And so we um, got the UBA folks in Katsina, for example, to work with Nearsol uh, and a DFID-funded team to basically um, do a, do a, um, a it, was some, it was small, it was a $2 million facility guaranteed by Nearsol for cotton farmers in Katsina. Um, and then all of the purchase of the cotton would be done by Chivita, which is a, a Dutch firm that operates in Nigeria. And, you know, it's something that seemed like a no-brainer. There was basically no risk for the bank. Um, but, you know, the reality was the farmers did have no collateral. They had no home address, no anything. And so it was only by them creating some kind of uh, cooperative structure that had a legal standing that they could now give the, the funds. And again, it was only $2 million. It was 90% guaranteed, so there's basically no risk. Um, but it still took, you know, six to nine months to make this happen. So I think it illustrates the difficulty. Uh, but at the same time, there is a lot of goodwill in the banks. Um, unfortunately, there aren't any bankers here, I don't think. Um, but there is a lot of goodwill in the banks. And I think with the right collaboration between bankers, um, you know, central banks, but then also people who are involved in agriculture to really help the banks understand how agriculture works so that they can lend, they can lend with more confidence. Um, then the other point that was, at, was asked is then how do you get the smallholder farmers to be small and medium enterprises? The problem is SMEs in Africa also don't have any access to finance. So getting them to be SMEs doesn't actually solve their financing problem. Um, but you know, solving the SME finance issue is for another conference. Okay. Okay. So top line observations from yesterday. Um, I would say the first one is it is very exciting to see that agriculture, the conversation has completely changed. And I mean, Gary's been at this for 40 years. I've only been at this for about five. But even in the, those, that five year period, um, when I first did my first agricultural project when I was in McKinsey in 2007, um, you know, agriculture wasn't seen as a business. It was a development problem to solve. And now, Agriculture is the way to solve the development problem. Um, so I think that's really interesting. The other is, if you look at a lot of the innovations, and you mentioned eight innovations in the pack. I never got the pack, so I didn't read it. But um, I saw the innovations mentioned yesterday, and the majority of them are all private sector. Again, five years ago, all of the emerging innovations in African agriculture were all you know, grant-funded, NGO-operated, and now it's all very much private sector-oriented, but built on years and years of Ex experimentation based on grant funding. So I don't think we should say, okay, let all the, you know, the NGOs and the, and, the, and the donors go away. It's just that we need to speed up the process of the grant funded innovation becoming commercialized and then being scaled and rolled out. Um, but it's exciting that there's a lot more innovation now that's private sector oriented and there's kind of a closer alignment now with the private sector and the development sector um, to make sure that those things scale up. Um, the other thing that I realized is 
uh, Nigeria is not the only country that's transforming their agriculture in Africa. Basically, every country is. You know, and we had a great pan the great panel with all the ministers. You know, regardless of the country, there is a massive plan to transform agriculture, commercialize it, etc. Now, you know, we saw the conversation between Uganda and South Sudan. We have to realize, every, just like every company, their responsibility is to their shareholders. Every country, their responsibility is to their citizens. So Uganda isn't going to do South Sudan any favors. South Sudan isn't going to do Uganda any favors. It's, it's in their own sovereign interest to build agriculture as best they can and become very competitive. But I think what we do need to see is maybe the next event needs to be with uh, agriculture ministers and foreign affairs ministers because I think we actually have to look at the geopolitical impacts of if every African country is transforming agriculture, what if now suddenly Africa has so much agricultural production that trade between countries that used to happen doesn't need to happen anymore and what the implications for that will be. Um, I remember when we were doing, uh, in McKinsey, doing the government of Kenya strategy, one of the things we recommended is, look, you need to um, do a lot more rice production in Kenya because you import so much. The problem was Pakistan said to Kenya, if you stop importing Pakistani rice, we won't buy your tea. Right? So they were actively using their agricultural strength um, you know, to, to force Kenya to buy their rice. And I don't think African countries are doing that yet. So I think we need to be very strategic, even on the foreign policy level, and how that relates to agriculture. Uh, thank you, Heather. I think I'll, I'll build on uh, some of Weba's comments. Yes, you do need to take some of the risk out of lending to small-scale farmers if we expect to get commercial banks to provide credit to those farmers. Uh, and we have successful examples of that, credit guarantees, uh, uh, Akin Adesina, mentioned yesterday a uh, credit guarantee that the Rockefeller Foundation established at Centenary Bank in Uganda. That was uh, eight, nine years ago. Um, the return on that to the foundation in interest, because we put a, a $500,000 uh, deposit in the bank as the, as the guarantee, and we've made more interest than we've lost in our share of the defaults, which were about 50% uh, initially. We've renegotiated the use of that $500,000 now two times, uh, with the bank putting in higher percentages uh, every time. And we still actually have that deposit. So we haven't, we haven't lost any money. We've, we've actually made some money uh, in interest in reducing that risk. But reducing risk often isn't enough because to get the commercial banks to lend to farmers, it has to be competitive. They have other opportunities to invest their capital uh, in the cities, in, uh, in uh, building uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, other opportunities that have less risk and less administrative cost associated with them. So another strategy to get them to invest is um, being pursued by an organization called the African Enterprise Challenge Fund. This is a, an organization which is actually hosted by AGRA, and what it does is provides grants and loans to commercial entities, including banks, not just banks, but including banks, to get them to make investments that they wouldn't otherwise make. So for example, they'll provide a a grant to a bank to open offices in remote rural areas that they wouldn't otherwise open in order to serve farmers. So there is a role here for, um, for donors because the African Enterprise Challenge Fund is, is primarily supported by donors. Divid uh, took the lead in creating it. But it not only removes some of the risks, but it provides a little bit of that upfront uh, investment funding that the private sector might not make on their own, and often they do not make on their own. So I think uh, we need to reduce risk, uh, but we also sometimes need to help the private sector see this as a competitive activity. Um, 
Gary, before you give your observations from yesterday, I just want to point out that what Gary's talking about, our support to Centenary Bank in Uganda, was through work that we do called program-related investing and PRIs. And many foundations have this, and I think that increasingly we should look at how that can support agriculture. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, observations from yesterday. I guess what's really struck me, um, again, what, what Weba said, and that is that uh, increasingly the private sector is being brought in to these agricultural uh, development, agricultural business opportunities that uh, are leading the, uh, the development that's occurring in, in Africa. I do remember back uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago uh, when our thinking was, well, we have to work through the government. We have to build the capacity in the, in the government to deliver the seeds, to, uh, to uh, provide the extension services and the like. And, and that's no longer the case. We recognize that the, uh, the private sector can often do that much better than government and on a sustainable basis. My other observation is that for the, really, for almost the first time, I see real concrete programs that are aimed at serving women farmers, and bringing youth back into agriculture. We've been talking about that for years, and it's been primarily rhetoric. Uh, but we heard yesterday of real concrete programs, uh, and uh, we need to monitor those programs, see which ones really work effectively, and then uh, expand those uh, across the continent. So uh, I think we're at the stage where we have some some real opportunities to walk the walk and not just talk the talk uh, with regard to uh, serving women farmers better and bringing youth into agriculture. So thank you. I would like to start out with a personal reflection from, from yesterday uh, and as uh, Judith Rodden and uh, President Goodluck Jonathan referred to Norman Bullock. Uh, I think one is, is to recognize that during the 90s that most others really neglected African agriculture. He, he kept the torch burning. Uh, but in my last conversation with Norm in 2008, he said, invest in research, prioritize innovation, and really focus on the youth. And I think that's, uh, it struck me uh, yesterday because I think that is also a red thread or, or, or kind of a common thread of all things we discussed uh, yesterday. Um, I would like to, to kind of take away three things from, from, from our conversation yesterday, and I think also partly responding to, to your questions. One is the innovation that we need in institutional capacity. Um, I think, you know, this sector and also many other sectors, but it's been too fragmented. If you look at within governments, uh, but also among, you know, donors, development partners, among foundations, NGOs, the private sector. Uh, we haven't really pulled our resources together. We haven't got the synergies. We haven't got the leverage. Um, I, I believe what we saw yesterday from Nigeria, driven from the Ministry of Agriculture, but in, in, in kind of partnership with the Ministry of Finance, and the support that they've had from, from, from uh, also from others, you know, to make that happen. In Ethiopia, we've seen over the last two years uh, setting up an agricultural transformation agency again to be cross-cutting across different ministries. Uh, we've seen in Tanzania something called a psycho center. It will be more of an honest broker. But these things we need to make happen. We need to pull our resources together uh, and that will be key. I think also the institutional, if you like, the way of organizing farmers, small-scale businesses is going to be key. We need to aggregate. We need to get more competitive. Uh, so I think that's one area we need to drive innovation. The other one is, is finance, which is, I think all of us agreed to. And um, the work that Grow Africa, and I might come back to it, but we're looking at three, call it buckets of three areas. One is agribusiness, the value chain finance. And as Gary said, you know, how do we bring in the banks with strong balance sheet more actively into this? How do we kind of buy down the risk? How do we get finance more affordable for the small businesses? The other one is more of what I would call the bottom up, you know, the microfinance. Um, uh, you know, opportunity international care, uh, save the children and others, you know, how do they, you know, work from saving and loan groups and link that into more commercial systems? How do we use technology, uh, MPESA or other, you know, tools, you know, uh, as we heard yesterday from, 
the fertilizer scheme here, you know, on, on, on this kind of electronic wallet. So I think, you know, applied technology into that space is going to be key. Um, and third, which is linked to this, is really the kind of the blended finance. How do we get um, money from, from donors, from government, from, from foundations? That could be guarantee schemes, it could be catalytic funding, patient capital. But all of these things need to be looked at together. And I think we need to really step up our effort and bring the parties together. Because that's, and if I'm listening to at least, you know, a lot of the companies we work with, domestic companies, this is one key area which is, you know, holding them back from expanding their, their, their activities and their business. And thirdly, it's, it's also, you know, linked to this is technology. How can we apply technology? We heard about that go yesterday on, on, on processing and bringing that, you know, closer to the farmer. We heard about, as I said, this electronic wallet. And I think all of these things we, we, we need to bring together. Uh, and accelerate and really get them to scale because that's going to be key how we apply these new technologies to the benefit of the smallholder farmers or to the small scale businesses. Just a few words of, uh, finally on, on Grow Africa. Grow Africa grew out of a partnership uh, or an ask really from the African Union and NEPAD linked to the CADA process. Uh, and I think the, re the reflection or recognition from the AU side was that on the private sector they hadn't really made too, too much progress. And to, to reach the 6% growth target, it will only happen if you really approach agriculture as an, you know, an, eco an economic sector and bring in the private sector much more actively. So the World Economic Forum teamed up with, with the AU and NEPAD to create a regional framework. As of today, there are nine partner countries uh, and more than 100 companies that have made so-called letters of intent, which is today more than uh, 5 billion US dollars in commitments. So there's a pipeline of commitments here coming in to the agriculture sector, being African-based domestic companies, regional companies, and international companies. The main thing now is how do we convert those commitments? And it's done in a tripartite relationship between governments making commitments to policy or improving the enabling environment, combined with development partners who would then put more funding into a supporting and enabling environment, supporting kind of the business side. And then companies making their commitments. This will put on paper and there will be a mutual accountability process together with CADAP on how we make that progress. And I have a few examples if someone is interested in, uh, later. But uh, we did a kind of a first year report for the initial companies who signed up together with the initial uh, uh, governments. And it's at least heading in the right direction on how we make that mutual accountability and also to your question on, on how to get governments to be accountable. This is a key tool to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I can't resist making a point. Um, at the dinner table where I sat last night, we got into the question of how do we get more foreign direct investment into agriculture and other sectors in Africa. And the point made by a, an African investor wanting to invest in more countries was there have to be working courts, that there needs to be a sound rule of law and uh, effective legal system. And I think um, there's, there's great interest in that. And that's really true whether we're talking about domestic investment, cross-regional investment within Africa, or investment from outside. So we don't often think of that, but I, I bet it's going to come up. Harold. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, it was, I'll start off with um, the observation, observations from yesterday. Um, I think um, coming from a research and development, with a research and development background, and what, interested, what was interesting was that um, the, the focus on the agricultural market value chain and um, I know we have been talking about this for quite a long time now, but yesterday I saw the, um, the wheel of, of the, 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 the speakers to integrate agricultural research and finance. I think that, that was, um, I think the, the path was set by the, um, the Rockefeller Foundation in the way it has structured the, the meeting, but then I think it took up from the discussions we had with the ministers and um, the questions we had. It was quite interesting to note that there was a strong link um, between agriculture and finance. Um, like I said, um, it, it seems as if, if, we look, if we're looking at the, the value chain, um, finance is at, put at the same level as agricultural research for development and, and as, as well as um, input supply. So these are the basis um, for, for the farmers. So I think that's a, that's a very, very 
interesting start of point. And I would like to mention a few things about um, finance from looking at, look at it from the research and development um, side of things. Yesterday there was a strong political statement made by the, the president of Nigeria and this was that agriculture should be looked at as a business and this was echoed um, by a lot of speakers, the other speakers who came on board. I think this is very important. We have been saying this but coming from the head of state I think from one of our heads of state that, that is a very very important point. And the, 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 the other point I would like to um, bring out is the fact that agriculture, sh well, the finance se sector should look at, at building, contribute to building entrepreneurship. I think that's very, very important. That came out again. And it's not only about building entrepreneurship at the production level, but all along through the, the, the value chain. And um, at times we tend to stick to our own side of the value chain, but yesterday there's a whole lot of discussions around the different um, areas and uh, some, somebody was talking about youth, we we're talking about youth, looking at youth, women, and, and, um, and how we should actually, the finance sector should actually deal with these issues. And a third point um, I would like to make is concerning finance itself and what are the different um, areas that we should focus on. And a lot of examples have been given in terms of the credit guarantee schemes that have been made. But um, there are other interesting things that I picked out from the discussions that, yes, these have been made, and, and, and Gary just said that this is something that has been happening for the past 10 years. But I think um, yesterday there were discussions on how these schemes should be hassle-free, how they should be adequate, and, and, and timely, um, otherwise we can have schemes and, and, and if they don't have this kind of characteristics, then it's useless, I mean, they, they wouldn't be able to help. The, and yesterday we, we, there were talks about long-term finance schemes and I think this is very important and there's a whole lot of discussion that, that could be um, developed around, and around this. New kinds of insurance scheme were also um, discussed and um, with regards to reducing risks and um, this is important because if we want to make investments in agriculture very attractive, these are the kinds of things that we should be looking at. Um, and I think somebody mentioned bundling insurance with credits. So these are opportunities, all opportunities for us to improve um, the way we're looking at our market chain. And um, just a particular um, point on, on women, and the Minister of Agriculture of Nigeria, I can mention, he said before leaving yesterday, he said that um, an um, what should be established, what we should be thinking about now of the financial st uh, the sector is about financing facility, creating a financing facility for women. I think this is, this is very, very important and um, um, those who are in the financial sector should be looking, looking at these issues. With respect to, with respect to, to the, the, my association and the interest and the questions you've asked, I think I'll focus on, on the I issue of youth. We have been talking about this for, for years and um, we are busy um, developing technologies, we're talking about um, innovations, but then, and somebody yesterday in the, in, the, in the group asked the question, yes, we have been talking about all of this, but are the farmers really adopting? What, what are, what's the importance of having all these innovations that are stocked up in, in shelves? And what we're looking at is, um, we have, um, CORAF record is actually um, coordinating a regional program, the West Africa Agricultural Productivity Program. And the, the objective of, of this program is to improve agricultural productivity. But we're doing this by improving um, technologies and innovations and generating through um, the establishment of research capacities um, in, in these different countries, in 13 different countries in West, in West Africa, and we want to extend it to, to Central Africa as well. And it's quite interesting because the, these funds are provided by the governments. Um, it's, it's turning around the case where we normally expect donors to give us funds, but we're, we're advocating that the government should put in some funds. And we divide, devised um, very um, innovative ways of, of getting the governments to put in the funds. And, um, and, and this has been facilitated by the World Bank. And now we're having, this um, program has been going on for the past five years. We're having quite interesting technologies and innovations which are of interest to the region, the West Africa region in particular. And we're, and we're thinking of how to develop um, 
um, schemes to, to develop job employment amongst youths and how to use this. And um, this is where the, the, the talk about ICT comes in, how we could um, actually package some of these innovations into, into very good um, stories for people who are interested in opening up business, youths who are interested in opening up business. Um, we, could, we could actually package this into, into lectures that we could put on, on websites, and they could go to the websites. We could also, um, it's, it's, it's all about um, um, sharing information, agricultural information, and then, um, and also creating the opportunities for, 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 for these youths who are interested in these technologies to have access to, to, to experts who can help them develop their, their enterprises and give them advice on how to do it and provide information on where to get credits because it's, it's some people are just interested in some of these things but they don't know how to do it. So we're, we're through the web, we're going to provide all of these this pieces of information so that somebody who's interested, for example, in developing HAK, which is a product of cassava, can simply go to the website, get the information, get um, the, the, the information on how to develop um, HAK, get the information on how to build up his, his or her business, and then start off with business, and also where to get credits. So these are some of the issues that we're thinking. And obviously, we, we, we're starting with agriculture, but we can also link this up with the ministries of employment, the ministries of youths, and I think if we, if we actually scale this up, this would be a great um, example of how we can actually um, develop um, employment and create wealth amongst the youth. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. I'm wondering if you want to add anything on the question of government accountability. That got a bit of short shrift. Well, um, yes. Um, uh, ten years ago, um, people are asking the, <coughs> the question, but um, I think if we, if we look across the board, uh, a lot of research has been done on, I think the first question is, um, where, where, where are we coming from? How was this decision made in Maputo? And um, I think it was, it was a will. You know, at times we say these things, um, I'm sure the, the, polit the, the decision makers were there and they, they had the willpower and they said, well, 10% should go into agriculture. Um, um, where, where did this figure come from? Nobody knew. But I think over the years, we have tried to look at this in different ways. And um, we've been working with IFPRI. IFPRI has done a lot of work on this, looking at this and, and how the governments are, are responding to this. And there, there are different ways of looking at it. Um, yesterday, one of the ministers said, if you look at the investment that has been made in agriculture in most of these countries, um, you know, and if we include all the sectors of agriculture, most of these countries are over 10% anyway. But I think um, um, we who are in the, the, the research for um, agricultural research for <laughs> development area are saying, well, we should try to look at this separately. Um, let's look at agricultural research, how much has gone into it. And I think um, yesterday um, mention was made that um, we're at an average of 5%. Um, we're very far from the 10%. Um, but I have a feeling that um, it's a question of um, sensitizing our our decision makers on how to assess this statement that they made 10 years ago. So I, I believe that there is the willpower to do it anyway. But we need to sensitize them on how to assess this um, statement that they made, contribution of 10% of the national budget to agriculture. And um, from the research that we're doing, the analysis that we're doing of all that, of what is happening in the area of agriculture, I think we're getting slowly to that point. Thank you very much. I can think of a, a couple of um, gaps that have been identified. One is youth. We're talking about reaching youth, and I'm aware that we could have invited more young people to this meeting. This, is, this happens in all of our meetings that we organize, so something for the Rockefeller Foundation and all of, all of you, all of us, to think about in the future. Another one, I think, is around monitoring and evaluation. We're talking about bold, ambitious programs, and we have to make sure that they're really having an impact. Um, there isn't time because we want to go right into the next breakout session, but I would encourage you, if you have questions for any of the panelists, to uh, reach out to them during the rest of the morning and the afternoon. 
Uh, if I could also add, it occurs to me that some great ideas and sources of information and, source and access to credit was mentioned on this panel. There will be a place on our website about this event going forward, and I think we can probably do a good job of posting some of those opportunities there so that they can be more easily shared. So please join me in thanking our panelists with a round of applause.